So dear friends, today we are discussing the topic against the politics of hate. Now, what is the definition of politics of hate? I think legally, so far, according to the United Nations, there's no real definition accepted globally of the politics of hate. But according to the United Nations, in June 2019, and I'll quote from that document, in the wake of what is defined as a global increase in xenophobia, racism, intolerance, violent misogyny, anti-Semitism, and anti-Muslim hatred around the world, the United Nations felt it important to produce a document called Strategies Against the Politics of Hate and Hate Speech. So in that, there are some definitions of hate and hate speech, which I think are relevant for us to understand today. What they say is, quote unquote, on hate speech, hate politics, and their advocacy. Quote, hatred and hostility are seen as intense and irrational emotions of opprobrium. I hope I pronounced that right. Intense and irrational emotions of opprobrium enmity and detestation towards the target group. The term advocacy is to be understood is requiring an intention to promote hatred publicly towards the target group. And the term incitement, kisi ko bharkana, uska jo paribhasha hai, to statements about national, racial, or religious groups which create an imminent risk of discrimination, hostility or violence, and they define hate speech as public speech that expresses hate or group or encourages violence towards a person or group based on something such as race, religion, sex or sexual orientation. So we say hum log ye samaj sakte hain कि जो यूएन या अंतर्राष्ट्रीय पैमाने पर जो परिभाषा है हेट पॉलिटिक्स और हेट स्पीच का वो एक जेनेरिक टर्म है वो केवल एक टारगेट ग्रुप का नहीं वो कई मुद्दे पर या कई आधार पर वो प्रकट हो सकता है तो जब हम लोग हेट स्पीच को समझने का प्रयास करेंगे हिंदुस्तान में ये अनिवार्य हो जाता है कि हिंदुस्तान में आज हेट पॉलिटिक्स जनरल हेट पॉलिटिक्स नहीं हमारे देश में आज पॉलिटिक्स ऑफ हेट का क्या रूप है और उसके क्या जड़ है दैट इज व्हाट वी हैव टू अंडरस्टैंड इन अ वेरी पर्टिकुलर कॉन्टेक्स्ट एंड आल्सो वी नो दैट हेट पॉलिटिक्स इज नॉट न्यू टू आर हिस्ट्री बिफोर इंडिपेंडेंस पोस्ट इंडिपेंडेंस वी हैव सीन सो मेनी डिफरेंट reflections of hate politics for example on the issue of caste now caste is not a category which has been included in the un definitions but if you look at it in india's context i think the caste system is one of the biggest institutions which have created the whole structure of hate politics in india through the ages but when we talk about hate politics in india today आज की हेट पॉलिटिक्स में क्या अंतर है ये हमें बहुत सम और उसके लिए आपको एक पॉलिटिकल अंडरस्टैंडिंग बताने की जरूरत है इसमें हेट लव का सवाल नहीं है सवाल है हेट की परिभाषा को समझने के लिए हिंदुस्तान में आपको एक पॉलिटिकल समझ बनाने की जरूरत है यू कैन जस्ट डिस्क्राइब इट इन टर्म्स ऑफ हेट फॉर समथिंग एंड लव फॉर समथिंग सो वॉट इज दैट so today there are two aspects which we have to look at one hate politics in india is not just by this or that group or contradictions and conflicts sometimes violent between this or that group which we have seen today hate politics in india 
is practiced by those in power, by the government in power. The RSS BJP venture, the joint venture which is in the central government today. And further, using their parliamentary majority, or you can say misusing their parliamentary majority, it is not just the government, but it is the different structures of the state itself, which is being suborned towards this goal or towards this vehicle of hate politics. Hate politics is not the goal. Hate politics is the way to meet the goal. So to understand the hate politics, we have to know what is the goal. And that is what the specific political and economic agenda of those in power today to change the very nature of the Republic of India and to convert it into the Hindutva Rashtra as defined by various ideologues of those in power. Now, I deliberately use the word Hindutva Rashtra as opposed to the word Hindu Rashtra. Because I believe that Hindutva is the political project to use religious belief among Hindus to manufacture an exclusive national identity based on religion. Now, the man who Modi ji is most inspired by, Goldwalker, you read his book now, in which he says, he talks about scavenging and how it's an inspirational thing to do. And that book is dedicated to Goldwalker. But anyway, to come back to Goldwalker, this is his quote, to understand the agenda. Hate politics is not the goal, as I said. What is the goal? In this country, Hindustan, the Hindu race, with its Hindu religion, Hindu culture, and Hindu language, Sanskrit and its offsprings, Sanskrit, as you know, being the language of the upper caste, complete the nation. All those not belonging naturally fall out of the pale of what is national. Now, if this is the understanding of what the goal of Hindutva is, the establishment of a Hindutva Rashtra, well, clearly, this is in direct conflict with the Constitution of India. The preamble of the Constitution of India, which says, we the people of India. It doesn't say, we the Hindus of India. It doesn't say, we the people of this or that caste or religion. It says, we the people of India. And this is what riles the RSS the most. Articles 14 and 15 of the Constitution, which hold all citizens equal before the law, and which prohibit discrimination on the basis of caste. So jab aap ek aise goal ko pura karna chahte hain, to aapke saamne mukhyata koon sa main baadha hai? Mera ye maanna hai, कि जब हम हेट पॉलिटिक्स समझने की कोशिश करेंगे कि बाधा उनके लिए क्या है बाधा है कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन बाधा है आर्टिकल 14 एंड 15 और बाधा है इंडियन सिटीजनशिप की परिभाषा सो नेचुरली टू अचीव दिस गोल द एडिफिस ऑफ द कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन द बेसिक पिलर्स ऑफ द कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन सेक्युलरिज्म democracy, social justice, federalism. Unless this edifice of the Constitution is dismantled, how are they going to achieve a change fundamentally in Indian citizenship, which is equal citizenship? How can you achieve a Hindutva Rashtra unless you attack the basic edifice of the Constitution of India. 
And each one of these is linked to the other. Now you know, for example, that today the word secularism is considered a dirty word by those in power, and this is not my saying so, led by Defense Minister Rajnath Singh, led by the Chief Minister of Uttar Pradesh, who calls himself a yogi, led by many of the others of the BJP, they have very clearly said secularism is a dirty word. It's a word which was included during the time of the emergency, during the time of an authoritarian regime. They have moved petitions in the Supreme Court to remove the word secularism. Last week, a Bhartiya Janata Party member of parliament has moved a private member's bill to remove the word secularism. So it, the, their intent is very clear. Their intention is very clear. Attack secularism. Now, remove it from the Constitution. Are you, you remove it from the Constitution. But the intrinsic nature of India's Constitution is secular, as I have just said. Article 14 and 15, the right to practice religion, the right to propagate religion of your choice, these are all fundamental characters. What the Supreme Court has said is the basic structure of the Constitution of India. So when you attack and when you want to remove secularism, it is not just a word which is abusive as far as they are concerned or abused. It is a very concept of secularism which we all know. Now, can you envisage an India which is democratic without secularism? No, there are some people who think, Are secularism secular hai. So we are democratic to democracy to secularism hum remove karte. Lekin ye baat nahi hai. What Ambedkar has said, each and every aspect of the Constitution is linked together. So, suppose, for example, you give up the word secularism or you give up the concept of secularism, what would it mean in terms of democracy in India? I think that is something that we have to look at. That would mean the introduction of religion and religious texts to determine rights. So if you remove secularism, if you remove equality, what is going to determine it? What your religion believes, the majority religion will then be the basis for jurisprudence, governance, laws, and so on and so forth. And therefore, those who are so deadly opposed to Pakistan being a theocratic state, want to exactly replicate, maybe not directly, but at least incrementally, the introduction of religious and religious texts as the basis for the constitution of India. And you will, of course, remember, matlab, jab sari dunya, sari log Hindustan mein constitution ka samarthan kar rahe the, constituted assembly ke paar hone ke baad, किसने उसका विरोध किया ये तो सब आप लोग जानते हैं वो ऑर्गेनाइजर जो आरएसएस का पत्रिका है और उनकी जो इतने लेख थे जो आज तक किसी ने उसको डिसोन नहीं किया है जिसमें लिखा था कि भई ये भारतीयता के अगर हमें करना है तो हमारे पास इतने कानून हैं हमारे पास सबसे बेहतर लॉगिवर है मनु हमारे पास मनुस्मृति है तो जब मनुस्मृति होता है तो ये विदेशी भावनाओं को लेकर ये जो कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन बना है ये भारत का कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन नहीं हो सकता है सो फ्रॉम द बिगिनिंग वॉट वी अंडरस्टैंड इज द वेरी कॉन्सेप्ट ऑफ डेमोक्रेसी एज बींग इक्वल राइट्स ऑफ ऑल सिटीजन हैज बीन एनेथमा टू द भारतीय जन आई मीन नॉट बीजेपी टू द आर एस एस ऑफ विच द बीजेपी is is a front of so the point that i want i'm making here is that every aspect of the constitution is linked if you remove secularism you are attacking democracy and democratic rights secularism being a fundamental and basic structure of the constitution cannot be tempered with tampered with so what is the way out for a Bhartiya Janata Party who wants the Hindu Rashtra? 
pack the judiciary, pressure the judiciary to accept such petitions which want the removal of the word secularism, or pressure the judiciary. After all, you have the Supreme Court, which is the apex court of this country, which is supposed to be the ultimate arbiter of justice as and when the executive fails. Although, of course, parliament should and must be the arbiter of justice, being the representative of the people of India. But legally, in our constitution, the Supreme Court is the apex body for justice. So now, if there is a barrier in this incremental implementation of a very specific goal of changing the nature of the Indian Republic, all those who are co constitute barriers to the achievement of this must be subverted. Now, this is not just a question of this or that judge. This is a basic aim as to how to subvert, to reach the goal of removal of secularism. You attack democracy, and in attacking democracy, you have to attack every single institution in India which represents any part of democratic functioning of the polity. That is the point here. What happened recently? Some gentleman was appointed to the election commission. His name was suggested within 20, he was a, a bureaucrat in the government. Within the 24 hours of his resignation, he was appointed as the election commissioner. The Supreme Court said, what is the process? Show us the files. So if such institutions, which are part of our constitutional framework, which ensure some autonomy from the narrow political interests of the executive, are to be subverted and subordinated to the might of the government, what is going to happen to democracy in India? So you start off by saying secularism is a dirty word. And in the process of dismantling the whole concept of secularism, you destroy democracy, you destroy institutions. You destroy the very framework on which parliamentary democracy in India stands. What is happening with parliament today? It's not just a question of suspension of opposition MPs. Of course, that is an issue. You raise an issue, it's not heard, you make a noise, out you go. On every issue of concern to the people of India. There are, there are checks and balances in the parliamentary process. There is a, a, an institution called a standing committee of different ministries, which you all know about. Today, bills are just passed in parliament without any reference to the standing committee. So using your power, you are attacking institutions which form the edifice of the Constitution of India. I have mentioned some of those. And I would specifically like to mention an example of how the judiciary is trying to be suborned and subordinated. And you all know what happened to Justice Murli Dharan. But I want this on record. I think, I mean, in the history of India, of course, we have seen the emergency and we have seen the way other regimes have also tried to silence judges or to you know, pressure them. That's all been happening. But have you ever heard of a case where a violent riot, a, a communal attacks are going on in the capital of India, where hate speeches are made which are directly linked to that violence? where not a single FIR is filed against leaders making those speeches because they happen to belong to the ruling party of India. And when a judge of the Delhi High Court calls out the police in open court, hearing 
The speech is made and asking them, do you or do not consider this hate speech? He was transferred at midnight. I mean, we all know this. But do we understand the significance of this? Because I think that was really the signal as to how this government, towards the implementation of its agenda of a Hindutva Rashtra, how it deals with those and institutions which it considers barriers. Since 2014 to 2020, 10,552 Indians, in seven years that is, were arrested under UAPA. But among these 10,552 arrests, in all these years, only 253 have actually been convicted. You can't get bail under UAPA for years. We did an RTI in Jharkhand. We found that almost a 1,000 very poor people are arrested under UAP, a large number of them are Adivasis, all called Maoists and shoved into jail with no legal redress. So there's some, Stan Swami was one of the people, you know, who was arrested and who died in police custody, in judicial custody or in jail custody. He was one of those who fought against this. But the point is that you have no evidence what is made very clear now that it is totally planted evidence using the notorious Pegasus software into the computers of those in the Bhima Kodigao case. That is the so-called prima facie evidence which has been used to arrest those activists for the last four years, many of them. So all this is the Hindutva way towards its goal, its political goal, these are the aspects of it. And we also know that it means the stifling, the muzzling of the press, the media. And we have the dubious distinction of being 150th out of 180 countries in the World Press Freedom Index, and we know how journalists who want to be impartial are bullied, are intimidated, how media outlets or media houses are taken over by corporates to be silenced. We know all that. And this is all part of this suppression of democracy and democratic rights which have been guaranteed to us by the Constitution of India. So what do we make of all this? Now you can say all this leads to the conclusion that yes, under the BJP RSS, India is an authoritarian regime. So this is one aspect I think becomes very clear from the narration of the facts which I have placed before you. But does it end there? No. Because the ideological backbone to this authoritarianism is communal. And today, the entire Hindutva project is linked to the creation and manufacture of an overarching Hindutva identity, which has nothing to do with religion and everything to do with a Hindutva based on hatred of other religions. Now, the Home Minister of India Mr. Amit Shah, I mean, whenever I think of Amit Shah, I just see a bulldozer, frankly. I mean, really. I mean, whatever he speaks, whatever he says, whatever he represents to me is that bulldozer which is just determined to destroy everything good in its wake. So anyway, it's this <clears throat> Mr. Bulldozer Amit Shah who gave an open call recently uh, to historians you may have seen that, Vishnu Priyaji, in which he says you will have the backing of the central government to rewrite our history. Now, think of what that means. 
What does it mean to rewrite our history? That is, to teach our children the falsehoods and distortions that our history is a history of Hindu versus Muslim. That the Muslim in the, the, the Mughals, that they were Muslims who were coming to impose Islam on India to destroy Hinduism rather than conquering armies successful because of local alliances with Hindu feudals and monarchs. For them, all Hindu emperors and kings are wonderful, even if they burnt their citizens at the stake, and all Muslims were evil. The caste system was nothing but a distorted division of labor done by the Muslims. That Manusmriti is the greatest law book of all time, that khap panchayats are benign institutions of social reform. You know, the UGC has just issued a circular to all of you. Vishnupriya, have you got it? Saying that please include the wonderful role of khap panchayats. Institutions which the Supreme Court has said you should prohibit, they, they want to glorify it. And etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So this is an assault on the heart of India on the shared cultures, as also the distinct cultures of multiple social groups. Pluralism, distinction, diversity, not the RSS credo of uniformity. The third aspect of this creation of Hindutva identity is for the RSS one of the most difficult and complicated, which is its commitment to Varnashram on the one hand, and secondly, its attempt to build an overarching so-called Hindu unity. So how do you do that? So what is the way that they do it? I mean, it's interesting. So this is sought to be achieved by promoting identities of various castes and subcastes. For example, specific subcastes among Dalits are identified, histories of leaders, cultures, etc., are studied and used to promote a distinct identity of the subcaste and pride in that identity. However, that identity remains within the four corners of caste hierarchies. So you're proud of your Balmiki ancestor, but you remain proud at the level that you are in the toxic caste system which is India. The commitment to the caste system is seen crudely in the Ghar Vapasi movement. Converts who are mostly coercively forced to return to the Hindu fold are inducted with their caste intact at the lowest rung of the hierarchy, whether Dalits or Adivasis. The fourth aspect of the building of this overarching Hindutva identity is also that for Hindu believers, unlike other religions, there is no one God or one holy text, such as the Bible or the Quran. So the crafting of an overarching Hindu identity sort of gets diluted by the existence of 30 crore or so Hindu gods and goddesses, each of which have their own cultures, their local cultures, their local ways of worship and practices. How do you build one Hindu identity when you have so many myriad local practices and cultures of believers in Hinduism? When we talk about hate politics, we see the violence against minority communities. And I would like to quote from what Bilkis Banu said when she filed her petition in the Supreme Court. She said, the decision to once again stand up and knock on the doors of justice was not easy for me. For a long time, 
after the men who destroyed my entire family and my life were released, I was simply numb. I was paralyzed with shock and fear. This is not just an individual voice of a single woman. Bilkis Banu cannot be separated from what is happening to a whole community of Indian citizens. Let's not fool ourselves that we can talk about being political against the politics of hate without recognizing and accepting that a substantial population in India is not, does not feel itself safe in this country. And everything which I have said Everything that I have related in the architecture of Hindutva, how is it implemented? I have said, and we believe, you cannot de-link things. You cannot think that today minority rights or a whole community believes and is under siege without understanding that you yourself are under siege. Your country is under siege. Your constitution is under siege. The very basis of democracy is under siege. Your economic rights and social justice is under siege because minority rights are an intrinsic part of this whole edifice of the constitution. You knock this out. You knock down the entire edifice. Please, we have to remember this. And the reason why I want to emphasize this, because there is such a large section of liberal opinion in India which believes, chalo ye minorities ke saath ho raha, itna to nahi ho raha, thoda kam yaha ho jayega, chalo ye to RSS ki bhagwat ne to kahi diya hai ki musulman bhi hamare bhai hai. Kahi diya hai na? तो ये सब क्या है जो ये लोग सब कर रहे हैं जो मार रहे पीट रहे हैं जो खुले आम एक पिलर पर बांध के गुजरात की पुलिस किसी को मार मार के पूरी जनता के सामने कर रही है लोग तालियां बजा रहे हैं ये तो एब्रेशंस है क्योंकि भागवत जी ने तो कह दिया है कि भाई मुसलमान भी इंसान और सिटीजन्स है कितनी बकवास है वॉट इज द रियालिटी टूडे माई डियर फ्रेंड्स Look at the political economy of it. Do you know in Karnataka after this whole hijab ban and when Muslims and others protested, in large parts of Karnataka where religious festivals have melas alongside with fairs and shops, etc., they officially passed a ban against Muslim shopkeepers to open their shops there. Do you know today of security agencies right here in the capital who are not employing Muslims because they say their clients will object if a Muslim is a security guard. Do you know the number of domestic workers today who are forced to change their name? Because if they go and work in a Hindu household, somebody the other, if not their direct employer, somebody the other in the building will say, Are in ke ghar mein to Musliman are. So the political economy and how it impacts the working people, that is also a very, a very cruel reality of this whole structure of targeting of the Muslim community. And communal violence is intrinsic to this agenda. It is not the only form but it is intrinsic to it. And I just want to say that through the years, all this nonsense about who is responsible for the violence, forget what we say. What do judicial inquiry commissions say? Through the years, 
I want to put this before you. Justice Jagmohan Reddy report in 1969 Ahmedabad violence. Justice DP Madan report on the communal violence in Bhivandi, Jalgaon, Mahad in 1970. Justice Joseph report on Telichari violence in 71. The inquiry report into violence in Jamshedpur in 79. The Venugol Rupal, uh, Gopal report on violence in Kanyakumari in 1982. The Sri Krishna report on Bombay violence in 1993. And of course, the Libahans Commission report on Ayodhya and the destruction and the demolition and the raising of the Babri Masjid. In each and every one of these cases, who have they held responsible? These are reports. After inquiries and investigation, not that nobody else was responsible, but who are primarily responsible? It is the RSS and Hindutva outfits. So violence is in the DNA of this Hindutva agenda. And it's violence primarily against the minority communities of India, the Muslims of India, although, of course, in many, many areas, particularly in Adivasi areas, we see how the Christians are being attacked. We see how churches are being raised to the ground. We see how prayer meetings are disrupted in the name of being conversion ceremonies. So yes, <coughs> hatred is reflected in the anti-minority violence in which the Supreme Court itself has expressed concern in a recent petition which they were hearing in October this year. They have mentioned the climate of violence in India. They have mentioned the importance of those in power to take strong steps against hate speech and those who give hate speech. What did the Assam chief minister say? Have you ever heard of something more outrageous, more objectionable than his remarks? Vote for Modi to prevent aftabs being born in every city or living in every city. This is a chief minister of a country, uh, of a state, making a statement like that. Aftab is a criminal. He has to be arrested, he has to be punished, he has to pay for his crime. Against that young woman, Shraddha, I don't think there's a single citizen in India who would disagree with that. But what is happening to women in this country? Every day, 86 women on an average are raped in this country. Every year, over 6,500 women are burned to death for dowry. In Assam itself, the National Family Health Service states that the highest rate of women reporting domestic violence was in Mr. Assam Chief Minister's state. Are they all aftabs? Today, the crime rate, conviction rate, against women in India, of crimes against them, including rape, 77% of the accused go free. There are hardly any convictions under the dowry laws. Today, 35 lakh cases of crimes against women are pending in the lower courts. Three lakh cases of crimes against women are pending in the high court. You want to communalize crimes against women? Are these all aftabs? On the contrary, my dear friends, if you are not an aftab, you have every hope of going free. It's because Bilkis Banu's rapist killers were not after. It's because the Hathras Dalip 
girl who was killed and raped, they happened to belong to the same upper caste as the chief minister of Uttar Pradesh. That is why every rule in the book was bent to try and exonerate them from that dreadful crime. So here is where we are in hate politics, my dear friends. Where the worst crimes against women or the crimes against Dalits, you communalize it. You look at the religious identity of the victim, you look at the religious identity of the accused, and then you decide whether you are going to take up the case or not. Why and how can India ever accept this? So in the implementation of the politics of hate, you have completely and utterly shown there are no betis for you to bachao with this kind of politics. And obviously, the vehicle for <coughs> politics of hate is and always has been hate speech. And as we know, I mean, my petition is pending since January 2020. In fact, in response to one of my petitions, one of the judges said, if they say and make an abuse with a smile, that cannot be considered hate speech. So now, don't be surprised if you see all the Hindutva gentlemen smiling and saying, Ham to kal aapko maag dalenge. So they're all free. So how do we bring all this together? All interlinked. Hate politics is not a goal in itself. Hate politics is towards a bigger political goal. And some of the ways that this is being taken forward is what I have tried to describe today. But how do we fight against it? And here's the thing. I mean, the bad news is that politics of hate is a reality, but the good news is that it can be defeated. It can be defeated. It can be defeated electorally, it can be defeated politically, it can be defeated socially. So when we talk about hate politics, we also have to give equal importance to the alternative visions we have as opposed to the politics of hate. Within these four pillars which I have described, those are not sufficient. I mean, I'm a communist, and I've been introduced as one. So I know that the Constitution of India is a constitution which has provided for the growth of huge inequalities and injustices in India. And I know that whatever socialist or whatever the inklings of socialism are in the Constitution are only in the directive principles which are not justiciable. And therefore, I have many criticisms about this weak link in the Constitution of India. I want the right to work to be a fundamental right. I want the fight against inequalities to be fundamental and justiciable in the Constitution of India. I want that whatever socialists in the Constitution become part of the fundamental rights of the Constitution. But today, if I stand for the Constitution, if I say that the fight for an alternative vision, which can go beyond the rights granted by the Constitution, but must always defend with the last drop of our thinking, our blood, the principles and the values of equality, of secularism, of democracy. So develop our own visions. 
I don't think we can fight Hindutva politics by a softer version of Hindutva politics. I don't think so. I don't think you can give up hardcore secularism. How you express it is different. But once you agree to a platform which you yourself use religion for political purposes, you've lost half the battle. You can't fight on that toxic ground which the BJP and RSS have prepared in this country. You can fight on alternatives, on visions, and the people will listen. And for that, we need unity. One of Safdar's huge contributions at that time was the way he built a bridge between intellectuals, thinkers, opinion makers, artists, and what Vishnupriya has described as the people and the people's voices and the people's concerns. Saftar was the bridge. I mean, he was not, he, he believed in that bridge and he worked towards that bridge. And I think it is that, what Ejaz Ahmed described as a structure of solidarities. We need that structure of solidarity and each one of us has a role to play in it. Cultural artists, performers, we have to think of wider platforms in which you can draw in all those who have an important role to play in the resistance to the assault on culture in the name of Hindutva culture. How do we fight it? How do we bring in historians? How do we bring in writers? How do we expand this structure of solidarities? Don't look only to opposition parties for their unity. Opposition parties, political parties, have a responsibility to the citizens of this country to defeat the RSS and BGP in what they are doing to India. But we have to be the agents of resistance among the people where we work, where we live, our relations with the people. And you are doing it. Jan Natya Manch and so many other groups, we are doing it. Let us see how today we can overcome whatever hurdles and barriers we have in our own work to build those wider and stru stronger structures of solidarity. I think solidarity with an alternative vision is what is going to prevent the achievement of the toxic goal. And I would say, I started off by saying the authoritarian regime. I added the corporate factor, the pro-corporate factor, so the authoritarian pro-corporate regime, and most importantly of all, the development of an identity based on the hate towards the minorities, the communal factor. So what we are resisting is a regime which is authoritarian, pro-corporate, and communal. And that is what we define as the purveyor of the politics of hate, using the avenues, the toxic words, which hurt more sometimes than bullets, which humiliate, which bully, which intimidate. And we are here, all of us together, to fight that. And as I said, the good news is that it can be fought. And the good news is they can be defeated. So once again, I pay my tribute to our dear, beloved comrade Saftar Hashmi. I thank my comrades in Janam for giving me this opportunity to speak today on this occasion. And I thank all of you for having the patience to listen to me. Thank you very much.